good evening everyone and uh, today we will be talking about the mallet finger injury now this is a very common injury that we come across just give me a moment i'll fix the mic i forgot to fix the mic so that you can have a clearer audio so uh, we'll be talking about the mallet finger injury today it's a very common problem that we come across and uh, how do we manage it? See, there are very common dilemmas. Even though it's a common problem, we have common dilemmas. Should we operate or not? Or should we just treat it conservatively? Patient comes to you immediately after the injury. It's very simple. We can put in a splint. Patient comes to us after five months with the mallet finger. Can we apply a splint or should we operate? If we should operate, what are the assessment criteria? Sorry, for criteria for operating. So all these we'll try to clear today in this talk on mallet finger injury. Please give me a moment. I'll just share my. Yep. So the agenda, as I have said, is going to be the mallet finger. We'll discuss the causes, the pathoanatomy. Sometimes it's a little confusing. No, we say mallet. What has actually happened? which part of the tendon is injured and what are the sequelae that can occur if it is not treated. And then we'll talk about the assessment of the problem, how to go about making a decision. Now, in any problem, in any surgery, anywhere, any problem, the whole important point is the decision making. And we'll go through this process of decision making. It's not that somebody is going to come and tell us, do this. It's very simple to do it. But the difficult thing is making the decision ourselves. And that is when, uh, can I just please excuse me for a moment. Sir, sir, uh, good evening, sir. Sir, can I call you again? Sir, can I call you again? Shall I call you? I have today, 9 o'clock, I'll call you, sir. I'll call you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Bye, sir. Yeah, sorry. So now uh, we'll go into the understanding of the management and the decision making. As I was telling you, the decision making is so important. Now, this uh, after this presentation, you'll be able to take a decision on your own when you come across a patient with a mallet finger injury. And of course, we have the mandatory quiz question of the day. Hmm. The mallet finger, we all know what a mallet finger injury is. Mallet finger is, it is characterized by persistent flexion of the distal phalanx due to a lesion of the extensor apparatus at the level of the distal interphalanx joint. So that is understood. So when we think about the anatomy of the extensor tendon injury where the mallet finger occurs, it is a flat terminal extensor tendon which inserts at the base of the distal phalanx where it blends with the joint capsule. Now we need to remember this. It is very close under the skin and it is very close to the joint capsule which is underneath it. So this terminal tendon, it is almost difficult to separate out the extensor tendon at this level, at the level of the distal interferential joint from the skin above. If you want to separate from the skin above, you have to raise the flap so that you can get the extensor tendon. Secondly, if you want to dissect it from the joint capsule below, it is even more difficult. You will be ending up tearing the joint capsule or tearing the extensor tendon. The next is we need to remember the excursion of the extensor tendon at this level is just 4 millimeters. So just imagine in this 4 millimeters, if there is going to be a loss of 1 millimeter also, there is going to be a deficit over there. So just 4 millimeters, that is why patients come back, come to us with a deformity of a mallet finger. So even small gaps can result in a considerable lack of extension, the complete extension. They're going to have it from here to here, 
is only caused by four millimeters of movement. So if you're going to have even one millimeter, you're going to have a lag of about 10 to 20 degrees. So this also will be seen. Full extension of the distal phalanx is not only dependent on the terminal tendon that we talked about, it is also dependent on what is known as the intact oblique retinacular ligament. We'll see the anatomy of this oblique retinacular ligament, which is because it's very important as far as the reconstruction is concerned. Now, we are all aware of this. We have got a terminal tendon here. Now, how is this terminal tendon formed? It is formed by the uh, by the union of the, by the getting coalescing together of the two lateral bands or the lateral slips. Now, these lateral slips are formed from the common extensor tendon. The common extensor tendon, that, that is the extensor digital tools for the fingers, this runs over the proximal phalanx. At the level of the middle of the proximal phalanx, it splits into three. One central slip and two lateral slips. These two, la the central slip gets attached to the base of the middle phalanx at the, at the, on the dorsal axis. The two lateral slips run on either side and then join together at the level of the middle of the middle phalanx and join together to form the terminal. However, it is not so simple because we have the attachment of the lumbricals and the intrashe on both sides to the lateral slips. Here you can see the lumbrical muscle and this side you have the intrashe. They are attaching also. So actually the muscle that extends the distal interphalangeal joint is the intrinsic muscle. So why, why is it that you have so much of complication here is even for the flexors, even for the flexion of the fingers, you, do, you have flexion by the flexor, long flexor, only at the proximal in, distal interphalangeal joint. The flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint is achieved by the lumbrical muscles or the intrashe muscles. Similarly, the extension of the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints are achieved by the lumbrical muscles and intrashe muscles, together called the intrinsic muscles, supported by the extensor tendon. So once we have understood this, we'll go into this. Now you can see that this is the green shows the intrinsic muscles. On one side you have the intrashe and the lumbrical on the other side. And these, and this is the extensor, this yellow color is the extensor which splits into three. I told you at the level of the middle of the proximal phalanx. The central slip inserts onto the middle or on the dorsal aspect of the middle phalanx and the lateral slips go on either side and join together distally over the dorsum of the middle phalanx, then form the terminal tendon and get inserted into the distal phalanx. Where is the oblique retinacular ligament and what is its role? The oblique retinacular ligaments originate from the flexor tendon sheath, courses uh, to the, across the proximal interphalangeal joint and merges with the extensor tendon. Landsphere noted that it acts as the dynamic tenodesis that, uh, that uh, tightens the proximal interphalangeal joint extension, causing uh, the distal interphalangeal joint extension. Now, check rein for effective and reproducible surgical interventions for swan neck and mallet deformities. Now, if you look at it, you have got two types of retinacular ligaments. One is called the transverse retinacular ligament, shown in blue here. This is the PIP joint, and this is the oblique retinacular ligament. So you've got transverse retinacular ligament and oblique retinacular ligament. This transverse retinacular ligament runs from the flexor sheath. This is a flexor sheath. It is not attached to the tendon. It is attached to the flexor sheath. And this is attached. This transverse retinacular ligament arises from the flexor sheath, which is a immobile structure and is attached to the extensor tendon to a that is a mobile structure so it sorts of anchors it the second is the oblique retinacular ligament which is also arising from the flexor sheath and attached to the terminal tendon which is also a mobile structure so and the important thing is it runs across the pip joint on the volar aspect so it acts like a tenodesis effect now, 
mallet finger, we know it's a drop finger and it is caused by an extensor lag due to a zone 1 or zone 2 level extensor tendon injury. So obviously, there is a lack of active extension of the distal interphalangeal joint. That, that much is quite understandable. In a chronic injury, there is loss of passive extension. In a chronic injury, there is a continued flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. So what happens, it may become stiff in that position, in which case there may even be a loss of passive extension. When the patient comes to us in the acute stage or within a few weeks or months, we are able to passively extend it. But if the patient has been neglecting his mallet finger injury, in the chronic stage, you will not be able to passively extend it also. So that will play a role in the decision making. And of course, the same uh, mallet finger can occur in the thumb also. Usually, in the thumb, the mallet finger injury is associated with tendon avulsion with little or no bony component. Now, how does the mallet finger occur? It is usually caused by a forceful hyperflexion injury and a pure, uh, it, this pure uh, forceful hyperflexion injury. It's sometimes called a baseball finger. When the baseball hits, when the, when the, uh, when the player is going to catch, sometimes it gets, it gets the injury on the flexed finger. So when there is a forceful hyperflexion injury, there is a pure tendon rupture and very small bone rupture. It can also be caused by acute hyperextension injury, in which case there will be a significant fracture of the terminal pharynx. So if you see a patient with a mallet finger, if there is a very small bony chip or no bony chip, it is usually caused by a forceful hyperextension, hyperflexion injury. If there is a large bony fragment, it is usually caused by an acute hyperextension injury. Sometimes you may have an open wound. Sometimes even a knife cut can cause an extensor injury there, causing a mallet finger. So even open injuries can cause. If there is a fracture, more than one third of the articular surface, you can have a widely displaced joint or even a volar subluxation. So, if you want to look at mallet finger, if you have a patient with a mallet finger injury, what we need to first see is whether it is a closed injury or an open injury. Obviously. And before we go into the management of whether, of what we do if it is an open injury and what we do if it is a closed injury, we need to classify the mallet finger. The single most important classification system for the mallet finger injury is the Doyle classification. There are four types basically. We'll see each type. Type 1 is closed with tendon avulsion or fracture. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so if it is a type 1, it is generally closed with a tendon avulsion. If it is a type 2, it is closed with a tendon laceration. If it is a type 3, it's a tendon abrasion with skin loss or skin injury. And type 4 is a tendon injury with significant bone fragment. So when you have a significant bone fragment, it is a type 4. Now this is a type 1. Type 1 closed with tendon avulsion. You can make out here that the tendon has come out from the base of the, from the insertion, that is the base of the terminal phalanx, with either no bone or just a small bony chip like this. So this is a type 1 injury. This is a type 2 Doyle classification, which is a closed tendon laceration. This can also occur. The tendon gets lacerated inside and you cannot make out anything on the x-ray. Type 3 is tendon abrasion with tendon and skin loss or tendon laceration and skin loss. Here you can make out this is the extensor tendon that has been ruptured. 
this is the skin wound and uh, the wound is extending up to the nail fold you can see that so this is the type 3 these are quite common but this is also quite common that is the type 4 tendon injury which has got a significant bone fragment you can see the significant bone fragment here and you can see a uh, volar subluxation you can see this volar subluxation because this extensor has come out totally <clears throat> so to recapitulate type 1 is a closed injury with only a tendon avulsion with or without a very small chip fracture type 2 is a closed injury with a tendon laceration type 3 is a tendon abrasion with tendon injury type with a skin injury and type 4 is there is a tendon injury with a significant bony fragment. Type 4 has been further classified by Damron and Engber. <clears throat> type 4A is distal phalanx physial injuries in children. 4B is distal uh, phalanx fractures in adults involving 50% of the joint surface, <clears throat> 30 to 50%. And uh, in 4C, Fracture fragment is more than 50% or associated with volar subluxation. We have seen a picture. You can see the volar subluxation. So this comes under type 4C because it is around 30 to 40% of the articular surface. But there is a volar subluxation. So it automatic, automatically comes under type 4C even though it is less than 50%. Basically, we will go with the decision making and treatment protocol following the thumb rule that says type 1 injury splinting, type 2, two injury splinting with or without surgery, type 3 surgery. We saw type 3 is an open injury, so type 3 is surgery, type 1 and 2 are closed injuries, splinting if it is type 2 with the laceration of the tendon, you can either do just splinting or it can be added on with surgery. And type 4, where there is a large bony segment, surgery is the primary treatment of choice. Now we have got a basic treatment protocol. Now we'll see each type. So basically, treatment for the mallet finger injury can be either non-surgical or surgical. We shall first consider the non-surgical management. Closed injuries, when you are doing a non-surgical management, you need to apply a splinting for 6 to 8 weeks. It's basic. You have to follow it for 6 to 8 weeks. You can apply either foam padded aluminum splints, molded plastic splints or custom thermoplastic splints. Different types of splints are available. We'll see the different splints and we'll see how they are applied. But we need to remember that splints form the basis of non-surgical management of mallet finger injuries. In open injuries also you can use the splints as an adjunctive management along with surgery. If you do surgery, it doesn't mean you will not preclude the use of splints. You will also be using the splints along with the surgery and I, uh, apart from using the splints as a standalone treatment. When you talk about splints, we need to immobilize the distal interphalangeal joint in extension while sparing the proximal interphalangeal joint. In the early days, when they started the treatment, they wanted to immobilize both the joints, but now it has been found that the, the, the forces that are act on the terminal tendon are not influenced much by the movement at the PIP joint. So the PIP joint is not immobilized. We need to immobilize only the distal interphalangeal joint. And this immobilization of the distal interphalangeal joint must be by extension or slight hyperextension of the joint so that the two ruptured ends of the tendons can get closer to each other. That is what happens in a splinting. And you have a scar formation. Remember, the, the excursion of this tendon is only 4 millimeters. So what you want to achieve is a good healing. Good scar formation over there is enough. The fibrous tissue of the resulting scar is thought to be strong enough to restore the extension of the joint. This can be achieved as we have seen with the use of splints. The most important part of the conservative management is patient compliance because they're going to attach a splint that splint is going to be detachable. If the patient keeps throwing it away, it will not act. 
and remember the time period six to eight weeks. So these, as I said, there are three important splints, the stack splint. This is called the stack splint. It comes like this. Here, this is the stack splint and it keeps the finger in minimal hyperextension. You can have a perforated thermoplastic splint, which you may all have seen, or the aluminum foam splint. Now, this is the aluminum foam splint. You can make out the angle in which the splint has been made. This is an aluminum splint, which is covered with rexin, so that it is uh, it is it does not harm the patient. After covering with rexin, a foam is applied on the aspect which is going to be applied to the finger. Remember this angle. When this angle is applied, gentle extension, when the finger is placed on this, we have a very gentle hyperextension. We should avoid over hyperextending. Please do not do it because it has got detrimental effect on the skin and that may cause a problem as we shall see. So this is the, uh, the aluminum splint. You can make out the foam over here. And this, of course, is the Velcro tape or the adhesive tape, which is attached so that the patient can attach it on his own. So this has been applied. You can make out the position of the finger, when it, which is resting comfortably on the foam and kept in a position of extension or minimal hyperextension of 5 to 10 degrees and securely uh, taped with the using the self-adhesive tape. This has to be applied for six to eight weeks and night splinting for another two weeks. This must be told to the patient before the splint is applied. Cleaning and care should be advised. When the patient is taking a bath, if it is on the, if, when that patient wants to take it off, if it is on the uh, right hand or left hand, the patient can take it off when he is uh, taking a bath. When he's taking a bath, he should remember that the thumb, the finger should be kept in a position of extension. Because it is not possible to do it when he's taking a bath, he needs to continue wearing the splint, but a plastic paper should be applied over it when he's taking a bath. When he is taking out the splint, he needs to clean the skin uh, occasionally, about two to three times a day. When he is taking out the splint, he must be advised that he must keep the finger hyperextended like this while the splint is taken out, cleaned and reapplied. If there is an inadvertent flexion, we need to restart the program. This is a very important thing because mallet finger injury is very difficult to correct and very difficult to get excellent results that the patient thinks we will get. So here, one of the easiest options is a splinting. And this splinting is dependent completely on the patient's compliance. So we need to re-emphasize the need for complete care of the splint. In children, this may not be possible. So for children and in non-compliant adults, we can do what is known as a cast. You can apply a cast. Now, this was described by Smilib, who said that you keep the PIP joint in 60 degrees. It is not possible to keep a cast only for the DIP joint because it may fall off. So we need to keep the PIP joint in 60 degree of flexion and DIP joint in slight hyperextension. This must be applied for four weeks to six weeks. This casting can be done, as I said, for children and non-compliant adults who may not be compliant. So, does splinting have any complications? Yes, splinting can have complications, but the good thing is most of the complications that occur because of splinting are short term and are reversible. Skin maceration and ulceration can occur due to hyperextension. If we keep it hyperextended, there is a folds of skin that get, uh, uh, that get together and this can undergo maceration, especially when the splint is applied. There is going to be sweating under that uh, splint, under the tape of the splint, and this will lead to maceration of the folds of skin on the dorsal aspect. Allergy can occur to the tape. Splint-related pain, uh, 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 applying it for too long, patients may complain of pain. Persistent extensor lag. This is a problem that can occur and displacement of the fracture fragment. The last two complications that are seen, that is persistent extensor lag and displacement of the fracture fragment at the end of six weeks, need, it means that we need to go in for a surgical management. 
So, as we said, preventing complications, just 20 degrees of hyperextension. And you can use the different types of splints. Each type of splint has got a different aeration. The stack splint, the thermoplastic splint, which has got holes to allow aeration. And of course, the aluminum splint with the rexin that I showed you. All of them are different. You, they can use two or three splints can be used alternatively. Now we come to the surgical management. What are the indications for surgery? As we have seen, the splints can be applied for a acute injury. It can be applied even if the patient presents at up to six months of injury. Patient has had an injury, patient has had no treatment, patient comes to you after six months. If the joint is still passively mobile and it is free, you can always apply a splint and hope for the scar to form. because. Having wasted six months, there is nothing wrong in another six weeks when there is a chance for a scar formation. So this way, you can apply the splint even up to six months. But after six months, usually it is not ideal to apply to try a splint uh, therapy, uh, a course of splint application. It is better to go in for a surgical management. So the indications for surgical management are the different types of surgical management we shall see now. Now, surgical management is indicated for open injuries or closed injuries. Either of these will need surgical management. If it is open injuries, you have an injury of the skin and you have the exposed and cut extensor tendon sometimes. The suturing of the skin alone and supporting the joint in extension or slight extension, hyperextension, as we have already seen, can be done. So, you are not doing, you don't need to do anything for the extensor tendon. This is one of the surgical management possible. You allow the scar to develop and this can be done. Or you can do a suturing that incorporates both the skin and the tendon. This is actually better. It is either you do only the skin repair or you do a in toto repair. That is we take a bite through the skin, through the extensor tendon that you can see, back through the extensor tendon, back to the skin and suture it in toto. Because tendon, because if you try to dissect the tendon, I told you the tendon is very uh, uh, is just under the skin, which is very delicate on the extensor aspect, uh, on the dorsal aspect, and on the volar aspect, it is quite close to the joint capsule. It's very difficult to di uh, dissect them out. If you are going to suture it, it becomes very tight. Using the uh, if you include the joint capsule. So it is better to take it along with the skin and extensor tendon, extensor tendon and skin and suture it. So this is also a technique. All we want to achieve is a good scar between the two ends so that you can have a good extensor tendon over the joint and no lag. That is what we want to achieve, no lag. Achieving absolute extensor ex uh, extension at the DAP joint may be a little difficult but what we want to achieve is no lag, but at the same time, patient should be able to do a flexion also. So this is what, we, and after doing this, we need to support it. Most of the surgical procedures include the step of passing a wire, K wire, one mm K wire through the distal interphalangeal joint, maintaining the distal interphalangeal joint in either neutral position or minimal hyperextension. This, it is not necessary to pass in this oblique fashion. It can be passed straight also so that it allows the tendon to heal with a good scar. Now you can see this. this is a, you can make out the joint opened out. This is the distal end of the cut tendon. You can make out that you can hardly see the joint capsule here. So here uh, you can make out this K wire over here and the, uh, the DIP joint is kept in slight hyper uh, extension. And the, it is, uh, the tendons come together, that is what we need to achieve. Now the skin has to be closed, that's all. Is there an indication for surgical management in closed injuries? Yes. One, when the fracture size is greater than 30% of the joint surface. When surgical intervention is indicated, the size of the avulse fra fragment should be carefully evaluated. Now, when, the, when there is a fracture fragment, more than 30% of the articular surface, we plan for a surgical management. But what surgical management we plan depends on the size of the fracture fragment. If it is a very small fragment, that is just about 30%, 
indirect reduction by what is known as the extensor block pin fixation, otherwise called the doorstop osteosynthesis. This is a very simple technique, but it what we want to achieve is you want to get the two ends close together so that they can heal. This is exactly what the basic principle of surgical management of mallet finger. So we'll see how this is done. The distal phalanx is maximally flexed and one MMK wire is advanced into the middle phalanx at 45 degree angle, creating the extension block. You are preventing the, now we'll just see the diagram and the surgical procedure. The joint is then extended, reducing the fragment. So splint again applied for six weeks. Now look at this. This is the small bony fragment, about 30%. Now this is, you have to, once you extend this, what happens automatically, this will go backward. The bony fragment will run uh, proximally when you extend the distal interphalangeal joint passively. This will run backward. If it runs backward, the bony fragment cannot unite with the uh, with the terminal phalanx. So what we need to prevent is you need to prevent this uh, bony fragment from running backwards when you extend the joint. So you just put in a K wire over here at 45 degree angle. Clear. After doing that, when you extend this, these two bony ends will come together like this. We are not fixing the fracture. We are only bringing the, here we have prevented the mobile segment from running away by giving an extension block pinning. And then we extend the joint so that the terminal phalanx comes close to the fracture fragment and the healing can be achieved. This is the basis of doorstop osteosynthesis. To show you an example, now this patient who had a, you can make out a 30% uh, and here you can make out the, uh, the extension block pinning which was described by Ishiguro. So it's called the Ishiguro extension block pinning technique or the doorstop osteosynthesis. So if you have a bony fragment of about 30% of the articular surface, this technique is very useful. And uh, this uh, you can, if this patient comes to you on day one, you can try and splint for splint application, but it may not work. It may work, but what happens is because the distance between the bone and the bony fragment, the terminal phalanx and the bony fragment is more, the healing may occur, but there will be a lump that forms over there. The bony fragment that unites may unite, but it will form a big lump over there and patients will always find that a problem. Now, if the avals fragment is much larger from between 30 to 40 percent or more than 50 percent, we can do, you can fix that fragment itself directly. How can we do it? You can do it either by percutaneous pinning or by open reduction internal fixation, either by screw fixation or pull out suture. Now this, we need to calculate, this is how the size of the fragment, the bony fragment that has come out, we need to calculate and we also need to calculate what is the degree of joint subluxation by using these formulae, but these are more intricate. What we need to remember, if, if, the, if the fragment is larger, more than about 50%, we need to fix it directly to the, uh, to the bone and this can be done either by percutaneous pinning percutane without opening or by open reduction and pinning either with screws or by using the pull-out technique of Doyle. Now we shall see the third type of injury. We have seen a avulsion of the tendon. Uh, we have seen the rupture of the tendon. We have seen the avulsion of the tendon with a small bony fragment. We have seen the avulsion of the tendon with a large bony fragment. Now we'll see the avulsion of the tendon the just avulsion of the tendon alone. So it could be as we have seen with a large bony fragment or without a bony fragment. How do we differentiate? I mean the treatment is going to be different. So how do we differentiate? The diagnosis can be done with a high resolution ultrasound. Sometimes the x-ray may not reveal that small bony fragment but even then it does not matter because whether it's with a small bony fragment or whether it is just a tendon av uh, 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 avulsion alone, it comes under type 1 of Doyle. So you can continue with the conservative management, or if it fails, you can do a surgical procedure as we shall see. 
Now look at this. This is a typical uh, type 1 where you have a very small fracture fragment and uh, avulsion fragment. So this will come under type 1 Doyle classification and this can be managed. Some people think that when you have an avulsion, you can always suture it to the periosteum. Please remember, it can never be sutured to the periosteum. It will never be strong enough because the flexor tendon that is acting on the other side, the antagonistic muscle is very strong and your suture in the periosteum will not help. So this should not be done. There are two other techniques. You can use the pull-out suture or the anchor suture. Remember, all these are done if the splinting fails. If the splinting works after six to eight weeks, if there is still an extensor lag, if the extensor lag is a problem for the patient, depends on if it is more than 30 degrees of extensor lag, then we think about the surgical management. Otherwise, for all these, for type 1 splints are the base, mainstay of management. There are two techniques if you want to do a surgical management of avulsion, either a pull-out suture of Doyle or the anchor sutures. Now, the pull-out suture of Doyle, we'll see. The basic technique is you pass a transverse drill hole. Now we have to attach this tendon to the bone. It is very easy to suture uh, tendon to tendon and it's very easy to fix bone to bone. But when you have to attach tendon to bone, you need to have either an anchor suture or you need to pass a pull out suture. We pass a transverse drill hole through the base of the terminal phalanx, thread a proline stitch through the hole, take a bite in the avulsed end of the tendon and tie the suture and uh, now look at this. This is a chronic mallet. Patient has had a treatment with a splinting and it was a small avulsion segment. So patient has come back. To, so now we need to fix it. We are planning to use, do the, now look at this. We have opened it, exposed it. You can make out the tendon which has avulsed. You can make out the avulsed tendon there. Now how do we attach it to the bone? Obviously, we can see the tendon. You can see the distal portion where you can see the base of the terminal phalanx. You can make out the good gliding of the tendon also. Now, we need to attach it in that post. How are we going to attach it? As we know, we have planned either an anchor suture or the pull-out suture. We'll, we'll be showing the pull-out suture technique here. It is not as fast as us. Yes. It takes some time to load. Okay. Now, once, once you have identified that, now we have seen the base of the terminal phalanx. What we need to do now is, Okay, I'll show it to you at the end of the... Uh, so, the complications of open treatment. Now we have seen open treatment. We have seen how you can uh, just suture the skin and leave the tendon alone. We have seen all these methods of open treatment. You can just suture the skin alone or you can take an in toto suture along with the skin tendon and tendon skin and suture it. Thirdly, we also talked about the how you fix the small avulsion fragment which you can do with a percutaneous pin, which you can do with a pull-out suture or anchor suture. And if you have a, a bony fragment, how you, how you fix it. What are the complications of open treatment? It is very important because whenever you have to decide between a conservative management that is just splints alone and an open treatment, we need to remember all these complications. Infection, joint incongruity, Nail deformities can occur when you make your incision too close to the nail fold, which is very nearby, and sutures cutting through the skin, malunion, fixation or hardware failure, and joint stiffness. Now we'll see the other important uh, 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 entity called cross mallet. Mallet fingers sometimes 
patients tend to ignore this problem saying that this is a small injury that i sustained so a lot of patients will present to us with a chronic mallet or they have already come to us we have treated it and it has failed that also becomes a chronic mallet injury it is otherwise called as the hanging fingertip even a minimal increase in the tendon length so what has happened now is a scar has formed but it is slightly longer so what happens it causes an extensor lag in many patients and some amount of residual deformity will occur with the extension extension lag exceeding 40 to 50 percent patients will come for correction if it is much if it is a very small extension lag patients usually will not come if it is much more patients will definitely come to us in this case additional immobilization should again be thought of up to six months as i said up to six months after injury you can try the splinting I, especially if you doubt about the adequacy patient has not had any splinting at all you can always try the splints even now now if conservative treatment fails surgical treatment should now be discussed with the patient we have told the patient that splinting will will treat most of the problem but now the patient has come to us with still there is an extensor lag we need to talk about the surgical treatment when we talk about the surgical treatment of mallet finger we need to stress upon certain points due to the delicate equilibrium between the extensor and the flexor tendon system results are not always satisfactory none of the procedure available with in, will invariably pro provide excellent results or good results correction of the deformity may be incomplete there may be some loss of flexion in the dip joint because if you repair the tendon here you may have a difficulty in flexion that is also one of the problems that can be expected and pain reduction cannot be reliably predicted if so any accompanying arthritis of the joint should be ruled out and in case of cartilaginous deterioration dip joint fusion should be the surgical treatment offered to the patient not any other surgical management so how do we ma manage the neglected so far we have seen the acute mallet then you think of surgical management now we'll think we'll talk about the neglected that is patient is coming to you after a failure of the splint therapy or after no treatment at all we need to assess first the passive range if there is a contracture we need to apply a splint slowly to bring it back if there is no improvement we need to do a surgical release either an arthrolysis or tenolysis may be needed to completely bring the make the joint passively mobile and supple if there is still no improvement and evidence of bony involvement arthrodesis so this is if the contracture if after contracture there is a release in the passive range and the passive range becomes full we need to assess the angle if the angle is less than 30 degrees we can do three different types of surgery tenodermodesis abbreviato procedure or the tendon advancement procedure now you measure how do we measure the extensor lag now you look at this figure you can make out you mark a line and you can make out that this is about 45 degrees so the extensor lag is about 45 degrees in this patient if it is if it is less than 30 degrees you can do the three procedures that is tino dermodesis or an abbreviato procedure if it is more than 30 degrees we have two options one is a fowler's tenotomy and second is superior oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction we have already seen that the superior oblique i'm sorry the uh, the spiral oblique retinacular ligament is attached to the terminal tendon and it is attached to the fibrous flexor sheath so it acts as something like a dynamic tenodesis because it is crossing two joints so in this situation we have to think of this also so there are two procedures if it is more than 30 degrees which consists which which means it is a severe neg mallet deformity now we'll consider when it is less than 30 degrees there is a procedure called tenodermodesis otherwise called the brooks garner procedure you know that there is a scar that has formed inside which is long because it is long the patient is not able to extend the finger so what we need to do is you excise the ellipse of the skin and you repair the full thickness defect with non-absorbable sutures and put a temporary k-wire as is done for all 
mallet finger treatment. Now look at this. The skin is excised. The ellipse of skin is excised. And the scar is excised. And it is sutured. Like how we did a in total suturing using the skin and the tendon. The second is the abbreviato procedure, which is even smaller. Here, the extensor tendon is transected at the DAP joint and repaired directly without overlapping, without excising the scar tissue. Now, the scar contracture should correct the flexion deformity. Now, this procedure is done with the assumption that now we have created a scar over there and this scar will cause a contracture and this will correct the problem. This procedure is based on the principle that the previous procedure where you excise the scar will lead to tightening of the extensor tendon and patient will not be able to flex his DAP joint. So this is just you go in, cut the tendon, suture it, that's all. And similarly, DAP K wire is left on for six weeks and it is usually done within six months if there is a ligamentous laxity or normally it is done after six months to allow spontaneous correction. So any surgical procedure, or when do you call it a chronic mallet only after six months? The third procedure is called the tendon advancement. Here what happens, this is also an extreme procedure if the scar is very long, if the extension lag is more than 50 degrees, that means the scar there is quite long. So what we need to do is we need to overlap the tendon and suture it so that it becomes shortened. But it runs the risk of causing a tight tightness in flexion of the DAP joint. Now we'll come to the correction of more than 30 degrees, the Fowler's central slip tenotomy. Now this Fowler's central tip, uh, slip tenotomy is based on the fact that when the extensor, uh, when the mallet uh, deformity is allowed to become chronic, there are other changes which lead to something like the swan neck deformity. We'll see that also. So the Fowler central slip is you cut only the central slip, not the lateral slips. We know that the extensor tendon breaks into three. The central slip is attached to the base of the middle phalanx and the two lateral slips go on either side. You cut only the central slip, so you cause some weakening of the extension at the PIP joint and allow the forces to realign. This again, surgery can be done three months after injury when the extensor lag is more and immediate active motion should be started after the surgery. The next procedure is the spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction. We'll see the details of this under the next procedure where it restores the dynamic t nodes effect of the oblique retinacular ligaments and we use a free tendon graft to the dorsal base of the terminal phalanx and secured to the ulnar side of the flexor uh, sheath, tendon sheath. Remember, we want to reconstruct the uh, superior oblique retinacular ligament and so spiral oblique retinacular ligament, which normally arises from the flexor tendon sheath and is, and is attached to the terminal tendon. So that is what we'll see the details of this procedure soon. And lastly, as I said, DAP joint arthrodesis must always be thought in arthritis, deformity, infection or failed surgical procedure. Think of this, patient will have absolute pain relief and patient can start his PAP joint motion early. This arthrodesis can be done with K wires, tension band wiring or intramedullary screw fixation. And the position of arthrodesis is zero to 10 degree flexion. So this is an example to show with a headless screw uh, arthrodesis of the DAP joint. Now, when a chronic mallet deformity is allowed to develop, it is not just a mallet deformity. There are other changes that occur in the finger, which is called the swan neck deformity. The causes of swan neck deformity are many, of which mallet finger is one, mallet injury. Congenital proximal interphalangeal joint palmar plate laxity is one cause, and intrinsic tightness is the second cause. The third cause is mallet injury and mallet injury, then there is a mallet injury, how does it lead to a swan neck deformity? The disrupted extensor tendon results in a concentration of the extensor force at the PAP joint. Normally, the extensor force is directed towards the PAP and DAP joints. 
now the extensor is cut at the dip joint so all the force is now concentrated at the pip joint the force cannot be transmitted to the dip joint because the tendon has been injured and if the palmar plate of the joint is lax the swan neck immediately develops much earlier if the it is not lax to begin with it will stretch over time and as it keeps relaxing the extensor pull on the dorsal aspect will become more and more and result in hyper extension at the pip joint and flexion at the dip joint causing the characteristic swan neck deformity so now the mallet finger is here represented here injury at this side so what happens this becomes lax what happens to the flexor tendon the flexor tendon becomes weak at the dip joint because even though it is acting as you know if the extensor if the antagonistic muscle is not acting the muscle cannot be very powerful so this becomes weak so naturally what happens the force of flexion at the pip joint is reduced when the force of flexion at the pip joint is reduced because of weakness of the flexor over here and increased strength of the extensor over there as i told you the force is now concentrated on the pip joint so naturally and this is the axis of the pip joint so what happens this is the oblique retinacular ligament so what happens now as it keeps extending this oblique retinacular ligament that we saw now runs dorsal to the uh, axis of the pip joint when it goes dorsal it begins to act as an it begins to help the extension of the pip joint so what has happened now not only have we lost the uh, help of the oblique retin oblique retinacular ligament for extension of the dip joint it is also joined the enemy and started extending the pip joint so that is why we get this deformity so that is why the force becomes very much over here at the level of the pip joint so you have a swan neck deformity so the correction of the swan neck deformity will be by the fowler release or the tenotomy or the spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconst uh, reconstruction these are the two main surgical procedures for swan neck deformity which develops after the mallet finger deformity mallet finger injury a tenotomy of the central slip has been used to add to uh, correct this deformity in the patients with a chronic mallet deformity in which the terminal extensor tendon cannot be repaired or has been repaired and has failed the second is the spiral oblique retinacular ligament or the sorl reconstruction here a palmaris longus tendon graft is taken to restrain the pip joint extension and to extend the dip they are doing the opposite of what is now what has happened is there is a hyper extension at the pip joint and flexion at the dip joint what we are going to do is we are going to use the palmaris longus tendon to extend the dip joint and flex the pip joint how it is done is now this is the we know that this is the swan neck deformity due to the Uh, uh mallet deform mallet finger so imagine if you can do something like this if you can attach something over here till here it will cause it will correct the problem so that something is going to be a tendon graft now we take a tendon graft here attach it to the terminal phalanx once it is attached to the terminal phalanx this is brought down volar to the pip joint taken to the opposite side we bring it on the radial side for image for instance we bring it on the radial side then go volar to the pip joint go to the ulnar side the opposite side and then attach it or you can suture it to the flexor sheath on the ulnar side either with a pull through button or attach it to the flexor sheath here with a pull through button so swan neck and thirdly we talked about the fowler's tenotomy we talked about the uh, spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction the third is when it is not related to the mallet deformity of course it is not in relevance to our topic today of mallet finger deformity but we need to remember that swan neck deformity can occur due to different causes so the different surgical managements are available two of which we have discussed which are used when the swan neck deformity develops in a mallet injury so you can do a tenodesis of the fds tendon to strengthen the flexor side of the pip joint 
rehabilitation splinting is applied for 3 weeks if there is a surgical management ky for 3 weeks and remove the ky at 3 weeks and spl start splinting for another 2 weeks 2 to 3 weeks that is because we don't want to keep the ky in for more than 6 weeks if you suspect that it can get infected the k wire is a potential, the k wire uh, ex exit site is a potential for getting infected. If you feel it can get infected, you can always remove, but immediately it should be replaced with a splint, external splint. After eight weeks, we start gentle active flexion. For one week, active extension, active flexion. Second week, flexion up to 35 degrees if there is no extensor lag. But the night splint should be continued for four weeks. It is up to two to three weeks, it is safe to continue for four weeks because we may want to make sure that there is a very minimal extensor lag. So the evaluation of a extensor injury, mallet finger injury correction, if it, it, it can be called excellent if there is full flexion and full extension. It can be called good if there is 10 degree or less of extension loss and 20 degree less of flexion loss and fair if there is about 11 to 45 degree extension lag and poor if more than 45 degree extension lag and flexion lo loss also is there more than 45 degrees. So your treatment can result not only in not getting a good extension, it can also prevent the flexion from occurring. So we need to be very careful when you treat, when you choose the, uh, the treatment protocol, it can be either splinting, depend on splinting for all the treatment protocols. If it fails or if the patient has presented very late, then you think of surgical management. Or if there is a large bony fragment, think of a surgical management. Otherwise, it's going to be just splinting. So, conclusion is, that is exactly what the conclusion is. Most mallet injuries are treated with splinting. Surgery offers no big advantages over non-operative treatment in most of the cases of mallet finger injury, but there are some indications for surgery, especially when the bony fragment that has been avulsed is more than 30% of the articular surface, you must think of surgical management or when it is a chronic injury and your medical management with splints has failed, then you have to think of surgical management. Whenever possible, close treatment of mallet injury should be attempted. And when you do an open repair, careful rehabilitation is necessary to optimize the final motion. So this is, these are the important take-home messages when you're treating, with, when you're treating a mallet finger injury. Mallet finger injury may not present acutely all the time. You can get chronic cases. All you have to do is see the, whether the passive range is there, take an X-ray, and then take your decision. That's all. There's not much to it. You're going to consider the time that has elapsed. You're going to consider the other joints. Is there a swan neck deformity? Then take an x-ray to see if there is a bony chunk, if there is a bony fragment or not. Then you're going to decide on the treatment, which is mostly going to be a splint application. And then surgical management in some cases. The complications again of uh, uh, surgery after cr for chronic mallet 75% are long-term complications, infection, nail plate deformity, hardware failure as we have seen, DIP joint prominence. I told you sometimes you may have a prominence of the DIP joint and a DIP joint deformity. So now we come to the quiz question of the day. Uh, the Clostridium botulinum back. How many exotoxins? Two, four, six or eight? Yes, any answers? It's a very common thing, no? Botox. No answers? Two, sir. Uh-huh. Eight. Eight, sir. Yeah, Shida. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Eight is the right answer. Uh, you have said two. Only two are mainly used in medical practice, but there are eight toxins that are produced by Clostridium botulinum. So there are eight distinguishable exotoxins and uh, the eight toxins are named as A, B, C1, C2, D, F, G. And the most potent of these serotypes is A and B. 
So these two are available for medical use. That is why I think you said two. Now, does anybody know how the term botulinum arose? Clostridium botulinum. Botox comes from Clostridium botulinum. How did the term Clostridium botulinum comes for, come for that bacteria? Any idea? Okay. Now, the term, it has come from the term botulinus, which actually is a Latin word for the food item sausage. They thought that the sausage, eating sausages or sausage is the cause for this infection. So it came from that uh, uh, sausage, which has got the other term called as botulinus. So that is why it is called botulinum. Now, there are, I think there are two questions. We'll see the questions. No, there are no questions. Sita Raman has said six. I don't know what that means. Anyway, Sita, are you there? Okay. No, any questions? I hope now it is clear about what to do when you get a mallet finger injury. What do we do? How do we see the patient? How do you take a decision whether to continue it? Is now you have understood that splinting is the mainstay unless there is a large bony fragment. If there is a bony fragment, I'll see if I can get that operative video. I don't know what the time is. Can somebody tell me the time? It's nine o'clock. No, I just. It's nine o'clock. Yeah. I just. Uh... Any questions? Questions? Please? Of questions? Or comments? I'll just get that video. Just give me a moment, I'll get this video ready. Yeah, you're able to see the video now? Yeah, Should I wanted to make her first. I need to make her as the bone cutter stuff. Yes, sir. The skin look, madam. Now a straight drill hole that is for the seva at the comment. So now we have passed the drill hole. Now remove the. Taken a, what do you call it? Reversal. 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 And the thread again it goes through that. So now we have got two ends of the thread there, which will be tying over a button. You can't suture it straight away. I mean, you can't tie the knot straight away. Just a minute. 
check that. So next is on layer kappa. For some, you know, you take it there. Before that, I have to put in a straight K wire. Like if for now, but you can see it falling. Your still, it has still not been tied. So now, so now we have taken the thread through, we can now suture it. See, I have taken the butterfly, you know, the this. butterfly, you know. But before that, before that, we need to put in a K wire through this and stabilize the joint, okay? Lastly, the the suture is tied over there over the button. So this is left on for six weeks. Am I after six pointing, weeks, yeah. we remove it. Yes. 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 Yeah. Any there is one chat. Ah, from Bhagwat Kumar. Sometimes it is easier to apply the mallet splint in the dorsum of the finger. I have found this has better compliance and also helps to keep the PIP joint free to flex. A volar splint almost always interferes with PIP flexion. Yes, uh, that is right. Uh, I agree with you, Bhagwat. But when you apply it, uh, you have to apply the splint only till the middle of the middle phalanx. Only then we can uh, allow the PAP joint. Maybe what you are saying is true because it, it's much easier to apply and prevent uh, the PAP joint movement. Yes, I would agree. But I somehow feel, especially when you have sutured it also, it is easier to apply the splint on the uh, polar aspect. And the basic principle is if you want to prevent extension, you want to prevent flexion. So you apply the uh, splint on the volar aspect. There's nothing wrong in applying it on the extensor aspect. Thank you, Bhagavad. Yes, any more questions? Extension block uh, pinning x-ray showed is a direct pinning or former. Direct pinning it's a, it's a, it's an, oh, it's a, uh, what do you call as a percutaneous. I have, we have not opened it. It's a percutaneous procedure. Is, I think, that, is that the question asked? There is a, uh, Gigi Raj has asked the question whether extension block pinning is a direct pinning. I think he wants to know whether it is a, a open method or a closed method. It's a, a closed method. Thank you. Any more questions? I hope uh, we have made some uh, points clear about the mallet finger. Sir? Thank you, sir. If there are no questions, uh, anyone? You no know, questions, then I shall close the session. Thank you, sir. Thanks again. We'll see you uh, next week.